record. It should be recording. All right. Hey, Sahil. Uh, for those of you who, who are watching who don't know, Sahil is the founder of Gumroad, which is the service that I use to sell my ebooks. So I'm very grateful that Gumroad exists and I'm pretty excited to chat awesome. with Sahil. And Sahil, you texted me, you DM'd me on Twitter to ask about how I think about doing transitioning to YouTube. Right? Yeah. Question. Uh, I'm looking at your YouTube channel now. I mean, we are basically at like the same follow subscriber range. We're both at like just over a thousand subs. But uh, the 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 thing that jumps out at me is that you you haven't kind of uh, fleshed out your your landing page itself. Mm-hmm. So like, uh, w- and, and the super cool thing is that when I search for you on YouTube, there's a ton of like conversations that you've had with other people. There's like all these interviews and podcasts. So the first thing you should definitely do straight away is you should create a playlist. So you go into your YouTube account and you create a playlist and then you just add all of the videos or your favorite of the videos that you've done with other people Mm -hmm. so that people who go to your YouTube page can uh, see those videos as well. And I pressed cancel. And the other thing I would, I mean, I would flesh out your about page and I would put like, so there's, there's, this, there's all these little things that you can do to kind of make your page look more, uh, I want to say authoritative, but actually, I mean, I guess. Yeah, uh, like prolific it? maybe. Yeah, it's, 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 just, it's just little signals to show that you're serious, kind of, or that you are not, that, that you know, because the, the question I find myself asking is like, what makes someone subscribe, right? Because, you know, there's, there's benefits to having subscribers the same way it's benefits to having Twitter followers. And I, I do notice there's a very interesting disparity between people who, well, I mean, so there are the very big accounts that are, you know, they have established brands, tons of subscribers. That, that's like, you know, they, they, they've succeeded so well that you almost can't learn anything from them because they have so much resources and they're doing everything perfectly. But if you look at like mid-sized accounts or like, you know, people who have, different quality videos. For example, I have a friend. She has like, uh, she has like, I think at least a couple of hundred videos on her YouTube channel, but she has, again, barely more subscribers than me. And I think the reason for that is because while there's a lot of content, she's not presenting it in a way that makes it easy for someone passing by to convert. Because they, they, they'll be scrolling through in like a split second and they're like, what is this channel? I don't know. And so you need to have like a, like a banner photo and you need to have, and that's, that's my belief. I believe that you need to have a banner photo that shows again that you put in that much effort. And the, the signaling thing, I think, is the idea that there will be good and relevant content to come. And so how I'm, how I'm thinking about my YouTube is kind of like a, you know, I'm still, I still consider myself to be in very much the early stage of making. Someone left a comment recently that said, uh, I did a video which was like me playing guitar for and talking for half an hour with no plan, no editing, nothing. And some guy replied, this reminds me of 2007 YouTube. I love it. Which I think is, uh, is what I'm trying to do, which is I'm, I'm trying to avoid optimizing too early for polish or for editing and because I, I tried making one video essay with about like a video game environments where I'm like, oh, you know, here's the, here's the footage and then I'm talking over it and there's cuts and everything. It took me like several hours to make a 20 minute video and it should probably be shorter and I should probably have spent a couple more hours on it. But like, I'm like, okay, I just spent practically my whole day making one video and that video has like 200 to 300 views compared to some videos where I'm just talking into the camera for half an hour and it has like, right now it has like 800 views, which again, it doesn't seem like a huge deal at this stage, but based on my marketing background and my experience growing stuff, I find that there's very much this early stage where, where you don't have a huge audience yet. You might as well just spend, produce as much output as you can with as little effort and overhead as possible so that, um, people can, you know, there, there'll be blessings that you'll get without expecting, right? You'll accidentally have a title that happens to be something people are searching for. And then you'll get like search traffic on that video. And then you can subsequently optimize. You can change the thumbnails later on. You can change the titles. You can add timestamps. But yeah, I'm actually quite excited for you. I think that you already have such a clear voice on Twitter. You know what you're saying. 
and you have uh, there's already so much content of other people's interviews of you. So you could very easily, and in fact, you know, I, I was looking up Gumroad as well, and like Gumroad doesn't have a YouTube account, I think, right? When I search yeah. for, and there's a whole bunch of people who have made because Gumroad is such a good product. There have been so many people who have been making videos about how to make money on Gumroad, and you could easily, if you wanted to, you could start a Gumroad YouTube account, and you could create playlists <laughs> that that were populated by those videos if you wanted to kind of endorse it. I mean, it's up to you. You have to, you will yeah. want to do what is sensible for the brand. And then I imagine that in the long run, you know, you will want to kind of uh, celebrate creators from Gumroad. Or you could do that on your personal channel as well. So it's up to you. I think Gumroad is very interesting in that it's, it's a pretty small team, right? How many people do you guys have? Yeah, like 10, 15 people. Yeah, that's amazing. Considering the the amount of hype you guys have and and deservedly so because the product is is like it's, it's my favorite notification to get along Gumroad <laughs> and Shopify when I, it's the only the only two apps that I enable notifications for are Gumroad and Spotify, <laughs> Shopify because whenever I sell something I get it. Um, yeah, that's that's the broad strokes of of how I think about um, transitioning to YouTube. Do you have any questions? You want to talk about more stuff? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that that makes sense to me. I think it's interesting because that's, I think very strategically about Twitter and the funnel of Twitter and like how important the profile is, you know, the pin tweet is to, you know, like a lot of what you talk about. Uh, but I never considered applying the same sort of, you know, sort of uh, focus and thought to the, my YouTube account. I just haven't taken it seriously enough, you know? And I think you're right. Like people, People want to sh want to see that you're professional. I think like you're right. really trying to make this because I think a lot of people like. I mean, just like when I get a deck from a startup or anything else, like when there's just like quality there, like people respond really yeah. well to it, you know. And it's not hard too. Like there's just mm -hmm. not that many people who put in the work. Yeah, so and I signal mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. I think people also conflate um, professional with polished. And I don't think you actually have to be like, you know, a suit and tie or beautiful lighting or whatever. It just needs to be, you just need to signal that you're taking it seriously, that you want to be continuing to do it. And yeah, I feel like seeing the way you use Twitter, I'm sure you already have all of the, the necessary prerequisites. So actually, you know, like for me, I, I created my YouTube account very early on, like 2005. That was as a, primarily as a, as a consumer, I guess, of a person who watches videos. But uh, I did want to make videos. But at the time, I had like a really shitty laptop with a really shitty webcam. And I made a few videos of myself playing guitar. But the audio quality was horrible. The video quality was horrible. Uh, my playing was horrible. So if, if my playing was good, it would have offset the other two things. But like my video quality was bad. My playing was bad. I didn't have a good time recording. I didn't have people to talk to about it. So it's like, if you look at my YouTube history, that's like sporadically every once in a while, there's a video like every three to six months or something, which is, uh, you know, it's, it, I think it'll be funny to look back on like a couple of years from now. But, uh, you know, video technology has gotten better over the years. So I'm, I'm, I'm right now I'm recording this on my MacBook. Uh, camera, but I'm going to be buying a proper video camera that a, that a friend suggested. And, you know, so I have a mic now. Before I had the mic, the audio quality was worse. And it's just this little, uh, I made like 15 videos before I realized, oh, I should face the, the, like now it's nighttime, but in the morning when I'm facing the window, the natural light from the sun is nice. And it's all these little things that, you know, I wouldn't make that, like if somebody says, hey, I want to start a YouTube account, I wouldn't tell them any of those things. I'll just be like, make a fucking hundred videos, dude. Like you'll, you'll figure it out as you go. Like, oh, that thing is annoying me. What do I do to fix it? That kind of thing. And um, what else? So I think, so my belief, the reason I'm making so many YouTube videos now is that, you know, I feel like while there was like a first wave of the people who are kind of in the right space, in the right, the, the right you know, they, were, they had the right skill set. They were adjacent. They were kind of in the right zone to, to ride the wave. Of, of YouTube, like they kind of took off from 2007 until, until present day. And like, there's this whole separate sphere of people who are good at making content, specifically writing, right? Tw Twitter, Twitter, blog posts, you know, that kind of thing. But it's, just, it's not that they couldn't, they can't make videos. It's just that they never, it never occurred to them to do it. 
And maybe it's, you know, and I started this kind of before the, the COVID slash Zoom uh, giant change that, that's happening. But like, um, I, I guess this is my long-winded way of saying that the cost of producing video has gotten really, really cheap compared to a few years ago. The ease of doing it is it's easier than ever to do it. And um, people have not updated their understanding of that. And I, I'm hoping to change some people's perspective on this because I also think that uh, you, YouTube can, or just video content can be more intimate than writing in certain ways. So I, I'm, I consider myself like a writing first guy. Like my brain, I think in words when I'm, I'm typing all the time. But like there are things that I hesitate to write about because I can't control the way the other person will read it. And I'm sure you encounter this a lot on Twitter as well, where you know you, you tweet lots of short sentences that uh, that that some people can read uncharitably. And I think there's like tone and voice that comes out. Like if you're playful and if you're kind of a, or if you're hesitant about something, these are things that are easier to convey in speech and in like gesture than in text. So I bet that there's this whole kind of um, unexplored territory of people who are good communicators who haven't tried making video yet. And I bet there's going to be a huge, like, so when I talk about YouTube to people, they often tell me, oh, it's already, isn't it kind of already oversubscribed? Isn't it already like, you know, there's already like, like you've missed the boat. Like you've, it's already full of, of content creators who are, you know, going to great extremes and lengths to try and like, do controversial stuff or do extreme stuff just to get a few views but i think that's the entirely wrong approach for for like the people in our kind of sphere which is that you know like uh the Gervais principle by ribbon farm that blog post is like a very well respected blog post and cited by a lot of people but if you go on youtube and you search for it there is no good youtube video about it so anybody who comes along and makes a good video essay about that they will get like a ton of traction for it. And like I could list a whole bunch of, of blog posts that are well respected that would make uh that would be that would do super well if they were turned into video essays. But these people don't realize that because I think people who like to read and write also tend to just not be not be very comfortable with speaking and video. So there's that like kind of there's a there's a chasm they have to leap across and most people don't really do it because they're comfortable where they are. But like I think the rewards for doing it will be disproportionately high. And, you know, I'm putting my skin in the game. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to prove, my, prove the point. And already I find that um, my Gumroad... So, so like I post my Gumroad links on Twitter and on uh, YouTube as well, right? And so I, the conversion on my Gumroad clicks on YouTube are like slightly higher than on Twitter. So it's, I get way fewer clicks at the moment because it's like 20,000 Twitter followers and 1,000 YouTube subs. But... Uh, I think the the gum the conversion on YouTube is about eight percent, whereas on Twitter it's about six um, percent. And if you look at, let's say you go on Patreon and you look at the list of people who are getting money from their patrons, the video creators like are a whole order of magnitude are making a whole order of magnitude more money than the writers. So if you look at like a Wait But Why, which is like a popular blog that people respect and admire. I, th I think, uh, I can't remember the specific numbers, but it's like in the ballpark of maybe 8,000 to six, it's like low five figures. And like um, the YouTube videos that make similar, like I think um, Kurzatz, I can't remember, the, I can't pronounce it properly, but it's the video that makes, it's the, it's the channel that makes content that's kind of like Wait But Why articles, yeah. but in video. And they have like a freaking six figures of the, it's the same kind of content. It's the same minds that, similar minds that producing it. But I guess, again, if we, if we are people who read and write and we spend our time ar around other people who read and write, that becomes like our universe. And there's this whole bigger universe of people who, and you know, if you ask, if you ask the first group of people for feedback, like, should I make videos? They will tell you, ah, oh, you know, I don't really watch much videos. You know, I prefer to read, obviously, because this is the reading crowd. But like, there's this whole bigger sphere of people who watch videos and don't read. And it's really, I think it's really worth making the leap. Uh, we will see. Uh, I'm going to test it out and, and see what happens. If, if I play my, and when I first started doing Twitter thread webs, people were asking me like, what's the point of doing that? And now other people are doing it. So I'm pretty yeah, totally. confident that, yeah, we, as we do more, of, as we get, and I think it will be good. I think there can be a culture shift even. 
I mean, maybe not shift, but like as you get more kind of these thoughtful, um, or just any, I just want to see the whole space become more interesting and diverse. Yeah. Uh, that's, no, that's really interesting. I mean, I think even with Twitter, people say, you know, it's too late. Obviously, Twitter's been around for <laughs> yeah. 15 years, right? And constantly there are people, I mean, I remember talking to Ryan Hoover about this, where we were talking about Twitter, you know, this is like last year or something. And, you know, he has like 130,000, 100, at this point, 130,000 or something. And I had maybe like 60 or 70,000. And he was like, you know, like, what, like, I, everyone in tech knows who I am, right? Like, everyone in tech knows Product Hunt, knows Ryan. So, like, what's the point in tweeting? I've sort of capped out on my audience size. And I actually think that's not really true. Like, there, and I've noticed that, like, I'm surprised with how many followers I gain on a daily basis hundreds of people often even though i'm saying stuff that's like not crazy different than what i was saying a few months ago to kind of the same group of people but there's like it just i think i think we don't really comprehend as humans like how large like seven billion eight billion people like how big of a number that is that we're not even close to getting like to sort of like a saturation point and like i remember looking at sort of Naval's growth, Bology's growth, some of these really big Twitter accounts in tech and, and, and realizing like how, how a lot of it was just a function of doing it for a long time, you know, like starting, you know, with, a, with 10, 20, 30, 50,000 followers three or four years ago is what gets you to 200, 300, 400 plus thousand, right? It's yeah. just time. Uh, and so I was like, I, if I want to do this, you know, I should start now. I should start as soon as possible. Because it's going to take time, I think, right? Which is like with YouTube, I have a thousand subscribers. I started maybe like a year ago in terms of like posting actual videos. Um, but that's what it takes, right? Like it takes, now I can gain a hundred, you know, followers a day on Twitter or something. But that came from like, you know, it took time to get to that level, right? Where like Twitter yeah. is kind of showing me to more and more people over time. And I think you're totally right. Like YouTube has, is way, I mean, I'm living, sort of, I work in the creator economy, right? And so like, right. I know. I know like, that YouTube is by far the number one platform uh, for creators in terms of attention, sort of if you were trying to figure that out, like what is it worth to a creator? YouTube and Instagram are both much larger than, than Twitter. Twitter is, a sm is much smaller uh, because I think as you mentioned, because the way that people want to consume content is different. Not everyone has the same, yeah, sort of content curation uh, sort of like the same habits, right? Uh, like books, right? Or like yeah. a best-selling book, like a book that absolutely kills it in the business world will sell like 50,000, 25,000 copies. Like that's okay. considered very, if you sell that many in a year, you're considered, you're like a New York Times bestseller, right? Yeah. Like you don't need to sell that many books. Uh, but a tweet that gets 25,000 likes, like that happens frequently, right? Like yeah. there's, there's a lot more of those. Uh, and YouTube videos, like, you know, it's, it's an order of magnitude or two above that. Uh, so that's kind of why I wanted to get into it was, to, you know, mostly about like, there's a huge market here that for government, but also just for my own personal stuff, like YouTube is, is, is such a larger playing field. Uh, and then also the barrier is uh, the it's sort of the level of competition is much lower because Twitter, it's right. so easy to compete, right? You can that's just start, tweeting, you can start yeah. typing. Yeah. anyone can do it and I recommend everyone to do it right like I don't mind the competition but when you go on YouTube it's like like if you think about like how many tech CEOs founders are on YouTube like there's like three or you know there's like a very yeah. I right. can't even name them honestly right like I'm sure there are some right there are like I just don't pay attention to them but like it's just none of the you know there's there's so much opportunity there I think I think the, the one of the difficulties is the is figuring out how to create content I totally agree with you that like the number one thing to do is just start creating a lot of content mm -hmm. and figure, yeah. you'll, you'll figure out what the issues are and you'll sort of solve the problems better than if you read like 30 books on the subject first. Mm -hmm. But I do think there is like, I noticed this with my medium post that I wrote last year that like I put so much more work into that thing than anything else I had ever right. written. I put right. 40 to 50 hours just into like two to three, 4,000 words and it blew up, right? And so I do think there is sort of like the stochastic nature of YouTube too, where you might have like a single video that, right. it might not be because you put in a ton of effort, but you'll have right. like one video 
Like it might take a hundred videos to get to that one yeah. video, yeah. but that one video is going to take you from like a thousand subscribers to like 50,000 potentially. Right. Like, yeah. And that you won't know that day when you post it, that that is going to be the video. Uh, so I, I think that's like, I'm trying to figure, and I'm actually interested as a, as like a founder and an investor now, like I'm really interested in companies like mm -hmm, that are trying to kind of like, cause the way I think about mm -hmm, in that sort of space is, is you want to make video production easier and easier and easier and easier, where you can start to do things like the video essay kind of stuff where you can have slides in the back and do, but it needs to be, you know, it needs to add like a marginal amount of time to making a video instead of currently, you know, you might talk to the camera that you have listed up and then you have to like pick and choose all the things and get audio over to, you know, it's just a lot of the editing process is massive, right? Right. I think figuring out how to, how to reduce that, I think is going to be really compelling, especially because now you have live streaming things, right? So like, I think yeah. people are gonna want the tools to effectively do what like CNN and NBC can do with teams of people, except you might have like one person or you might be doing it yourself, right? Like, um, I don't know. I think there's a bit, I'm really interested, especially in the COVID era. Yeah. Like, because there's so many more people that are needing this because way more people are talking to a camera every day right i think there's so much like there's going to be so many opportunities yeah. so many companies that kind of solve these these mm -hmm. kind of problems which i'm super super interested in yeah so like the wild thing is you know even right now we're having a conversation on a zoom which like millions of people are doing at the same time and the only difference is that i hit the record button and then i'm going to upload it to right. youtube and like, there's probably like a thousand good conversations every day that's happening where the two people are not talking about or how, whether there's three or four people, they're chatting about something that is interesting, that there's no reason to actually keep it private because lots of other people would also be interested in it. And then it's just, you know, it's as, it's yeah. as simple as that. And, uh, it's but most people, think about. Yeah. most people don't even think about it. That's the, and in fact, you know, I wanted to bring up that, uh, you know, I was, I was having a, a moment of uh, reflection and gratitude yesterday was it earlier today I, my sense of time is messed up but like you know i was listing out tweets that kind of oh, made an impact yeah. on me yeah and then uh you know i had been following you for some time and i had you know i, I kind of knew what you were about and i, I knew about gumroad I, I think i had an account and i played around with it a little bit but then didn't do anything yet but it was that specific tweet that you wrote about uh, kind of people feeling guilty about asking for money and or something like that and, and that that was the, it clicked for me because it, i realized that you know i have definitely put it at up to that point i had been thinking about my work for way longer and i had been uh you know just i had seen people who put way less work and way less effort and and whatnot into something and then selling it and the only thing that kept me from doing that was really is purely kind of a internal psychological um, baggage hold up like I think I was remembering that way back when I was a musician you know some of us would criticize others for selling out or whatever and it's just yeah that, totally. re that realization that uh, you can be you know which is why I'm super excited about Gumroad still and again I feel like just as with YouTube like the the funny thing is I think at anytime anything happens people feel feel a need to kind of have a response and the response is calibrated on a roughly like a 1 to 10 scale of how good something is but the actual scale is like it's thousands or tens of thousands sometimes but most things are kind of in that range and similarly I feel like things like you can have a YouTube account and you can have a Gumroad account like I think even after you read like a positive review about it people still underestimate what it can do so like for me I've sold uh, like 700 ebooks and uh, and even the crazy thing was uh, I first started selling the ebooks at 799 US which was I copied it direct I copied that pricing directly from Drill I know Drill has his ebooks oh, yeah. as well. and I was like oh you know if, if people are buying a Drill ebook for 799 they'll also buy a Visa ebook for 79, 799 and so I sold like maybe a couple of hundred books like that and then someone was like hey why don't you just set the price to you know whatever people want to buy like just a throwaway comment I was like oh yeah let's try that and then some people every now and then would give me like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. And I'm like, holy shit, that one guy's um, comment like made me like hundreds of dollars, probably a thousand dollars maybe at this point from uh, like hundreds to a thousand. And the crazy thing for me is that 
it's not that I want to make money, but that, you know, having money means I have the freedom to do more creative stuff. So it's really like, a, it's, it's like creative freedom, you know, you know, at a few yeah. clicks, right? And yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to get as many people I, as possible to see this. Like, I, you know, I, I don't even think that I am, a, you know, like, I, I don't think I'm a very good writer. I don't think I'm a very good video producer or whatever. Like, if you ask me to honestly assess my abilities on a, on a, like, a percentile thing based on everybody's abilities in terms of how good they could be, I'm probably, like, 70 to 75-ish percentile. But if you then narrow that down to the people who actually show up and ship and publish and charge, then I think I go higher to like maybe 90-ish, right? And it's like, you know, and even then you could be in like 70-ish and if you show up, you're still going to make money and you're still going to have people who are interested oh. in your stuff and all that. But like, yeah, it's just, it's just I was reading um, Noah Kagan's uh, interview with you. I mean, I, I didn't click on the video, but I was reading what he said. And he said that you described exactly what, it would take for someone to work at Gumroad. Like you, you laid out the process of what you look for. And then he said, you know, like you would think that somebody who gave it all away like that would have, would be inundated with like hundreds of, of responses, but you don't get that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, it's yeah. so counterintuitive. There's so many things that are so counterintuitive about this whole marketplace in general. And I, I remember thinking that even way back when I used to work at, uh, I used to work at this company called Referral Candy, which sells referral programs to online stores like on Shopify, for example. And so we would get to see our internal data. We would get to see kind of who is buying what online, basically, because their friends refer and who is sharing referral links. And, and we would see how much revenue companies are making. And they're like, all oh, these unglamorous, not very interesting. I mean, you know, it's like it, they don't look glitzy and, and, and famous or shiny or whatever, but they're like making millions of dollars in, in revenue selling Ah, I can't even remember anymore, but like it's such normal products, right? It's so, and I'm, I'm sure it's true for, for like at Gumroad, you, you would see, I, I bet you have things like somebody writing about back pain or somebody writing about some specific niche oh, thing yeah. and they have like a huge audience and they're making lots of money. And yeah, it's just, it's, and then you, so you have, you have that, right? The people who are making the money and the people who are surviving doing what they love. And then on the other hand, if, if you spend too much time in comment sections and stuff, which I do, you see all these people who are kind of uh, groveling and, and frustrated that, you know, that there's no opportunity or that there's no, um, I mean, I'm not, I don't know if I'm framing it correctly, but it's just, if, if the people knew, like it's just, when, when, I, when I witness people complaining about any marketplace, whether we're talking about like dating or we're talking about getting a job or we're talking about selling a product or whatever, I always feel like I'm in bizarro land witnessing the complaints. I mean, like, there are legitimate complaints as well. Like when, you know, there's bad actors in the marketplace, for example, and stuff like that. But like the general sense of, um, you know, I can't find anybody. And like, I want to ask like, like, how are you looking? Like, what's your, what's your search process? How many people do you talk to before you decide that, you know, nobody's interested? And it's like a few here and there, like one every day. Like, you know, like if you really if you're really comprehensive yeah. and you're really resourceful and systematic, then like, I almost don't see how you could fail. Like it's just, but that's me. Eh? I, I was watching another one of your videos with, uh, I can't remember his name, shock, the, the, some, some guy. And he, you were saying that for you, it was like intolerable. If, if you're at work and like someone tells you that you're supposed to work with somebody else that you don't like or whatever, like, that kind of thing but most people kind of tolerate it and then it's like having that experience it's like you don't want to be rude I mean I don't want to be rude to people and, but like uh, I think I had a tweet that was something like people don't really want to solve their problems they kind of just want to talk about their problems and then continue making shitty de decisions and complain about the consequences which again, again I try to frame myself as this very optimistic friendly supportive nice guy but like there are some truths about the way the place is that if you don't acknowledge it, then there's this. Uh, anyway, I went off on a <laughs> tension. I'm. I'm. No, I, I mean, I, right. I think. I think you're correct. I mean, the the truth is, people people are where they want to be, to a degree. Uh, you know, as you mentioned in the beginning, you were saying, you know, people sometimes say, you know, life's not that bad. They're existing. Life is fine, and it takes a lot of work to like change things, right? Um, I mean, like. 
losing weight sucks, you know, like it's not fun. It's not easy. And especially in the beginning, you know, right. it gets easier. Like now I don't even think about sort of like some habits that I've formed. I just, you know, like I went to Costco yesterday with my wife and I realized like we got, like, I was like, this is like very healthy food. Like at the, nice. at the end, I was like, this is, but you know, that was just sort of like these sort of changes over time. And I think just most people don't do those. They, they sort of look at the big thing they need to do and they don't break it down. If you, you, you can break down, so like painting is a really good example of this. Like if, if you really, you can break down a painting to a level of steps that anybody could follow, anybody could follow, right? Like you could take the most, like the Mona Lisa, and you could break it down in a set of steps that anybody could basically go through those steps and, and sort of recreate Mona Lisa, right? That's possible. Uh, that's very different from like actually doing it. And also I think, people don't really get the design part of it, the architecture part of it, if that makes sense. Like there's the right. implementation of the, yeah. but there's coming up with the, what those steps even are and breaking right. down the sort of problem into a set of smaller problems. And I, I think a lot of people just get overwhelmed with it, right? Like they don't know, like, how do I make the Mona Lisa? Like, how is that even possible? Like it's so foreign to me. And it's like, well, you start with like drawing a box. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You start with drawing a box, you learn perspective, you learn a little bit of proportion, you learn some anatomy, you learn the bone and muscle structure of the face, right? You learn the proportions of the nose and the forehead and the, and, and the chin and, you know, and you can learn all of this stuff. Any, literally anybody can. Like there's a great book David Deutsch wrote called uh, uh, The Beginning of Infinity. Right. The first like six chapters are yeah. phenomenal. And he talks about this idea of humans being universal replicators, right? Where we can right. basically do anything and sort of reason about it. We can like, and this is sort of a thing that only humans can do. And it's like very interesting. And I guess his sort of point was people keep thinking like, oh, humans are kind of like, the, there's going to be things after humans. Like there are things stupider than humans. There are things smarter than humans. But there's sort of like this binary thing that's happened somewhere in the past where we can now sort of take we can basically do alchemy, right? We can take sort of like a set of messy atoms and create like the internet, which like basically like that there's nothing more. Like we're gonna, our brains are, are able of, are able to comp like evolution didn't lead to the internet, right? Like there's no way that like our genes produce right. the internet. It, it's, we, so we sort of like operate at a level that's we've sort of escaped our sort of physical bodies in a sense. Uh, and uh, I'm going on my own tangent now, but I just think that's sort of like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I think they have a how, how much they can comprehend over time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a funny, I have a funny David story as well. Uh, so I was, I was, so, so I have uh, a read.gift account, which is by Jaju Sam. I don't know if you know him. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so I, he, he, it's an app where you can just list out books that you'd like and people can buy them for you. And somebody bought me The Beginning of Infinity. So I did what I usually do, which is I made a Twitter thread while I was reading the book. And it turns out that I have a mutual friend with David Deutsch and she hmm. linked us up and, I, and we, we have a video on my YouTube channel where we're discussing the beginning oh, of activity uh, on my channel. Yeah, and it's like, it's such a, it's such a, like if you told me that was possible, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have not believed it, but like, uh, it's just, again, it, it reminded me of why the internet is so magical. It's like, I'm not, I'm not a physicist. I'm not a professional interviewer. I was just some earnest, nerdy guy tweeting about what I liked. And like, there's, every tweet, there's a chance that you might get connected with someone else about oh. something. And like, if you knew that, like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I was talking to my wife recently about how, um, you know, so as my account kind of grows, I have, like the, 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 I want to be honest about like the costs of becoming more and more of a public figure or becoming more and more thing, which is that the, the, the surface area of, of that you come in contact with of the public gets larger and larger and it becomes more and more inevitable that some people will interpret whatever you're saying in the worst possible way. And like, you know, the, and I, I try to integrate everybody's um, feedback and criticism and whatnot into my worldview and my thinking like that made a lot of sense when you're like small and you're starting out but as it gets bigger and bigger like you start getting weird responses that even if you, if you consider it it can drive you a little bit crazy and the one that i kind of think about a lot is like uh so every so often somebody will call me like a narcissist or a sociopath and i and i agonize about it and the funny thing is i know that 
a real narcissist would either, they would either agree or they would disagree. They'd be like, yes, I'm a narcissist or no, I'm not a narcissist. And that's it. And I'm like, am I, am I not? I'm not sure. I don't want to be, but you know. And then I think about how like, but the reason I make stuff is not that I'm obsessed about me. It's, I mean, I talk quite a bit about me because me is, is the stuff that I know very well, right? But like, I'm curious about everything. And it's like, if you see the world the way I see it, which is that, Literally every single thing around you is like an opportunity to connect with someone in the world with 7 billion people. Like then it's, to me, it's almost like the, the efficient market hypothesis thing where, you know, people are saying if there's a $20 bill on a crowded subway or whatever and no one's picking it up, like that, that's something wrong there because, you know, everyone would pick up a $20 bill for free immediately. But like the way I see it, I feel like we are swimming in unpicked $20 bills, but nobody knows that they're $20 bills. And like, I don't see them. Yeah. So it's like every video that you don't make or every Twitter thread that you don't make is connections that you don't make. And it's, that's wealth that you're not making. Right. So now I have, and I'm sure this is true for you as well. Like probably more so like I can go to any, well, pandemic so you can't travel but b- before the, the pandemic i could conceivably go to any major city in the world and i would have like a twitter friend somewhere there who would want to show me around want to buy me dinner and like you know like just kind of introduce me and it's like it'd be my personal tour guide which is like it's a re- it's real wealth that has been created between humans that people just don't seem to understand or you know they i guess they are so overwhelmed by having encountered um, kind of bad actors people who are manipulated for scheming or trying to extract value without giving anything back in turn like they are they're kind of extra they have like an anti they have like a security mechanism to 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 keep out people like that and so that it can be a bit overactive and so when there's like a good faith ambitious person trying to do good stuff they'll be like hey that's that's suspicious why are you trying to why are you trying to make so much money or why are you trying to you know make yeah. so many friends or what's your what's your what's your angle yeah. so that's kind of mm-hmm. it's interesting like i am very similar like i and i didn't really recognize how rare it was like i had a tweet i don't know maybe a couple months ago that i was like you know in, in the six years i lived in san francisco i met i forget the number but it was thousands of people for coffee one on thousands nice. of people uh, it was like seven or 8,000 people or something. Uh, like, a, that's a lot, you know, I did the math and, and before I tweeted it, cause I want to make sure I'm <laughs> accurate. Yeah. I don't, I, don't I, I have a rule actually on Twitter that I, I really try not to use any hyperbole or, or exaggeration, even on the yeah. pithy tweets. Mm-hmm. Like if you read them literally, like they're, they actually are true. They should be true. Right. They, yeah. they, they sort of are interpreted sort of in a different way sometimes, but, but, uh, what was my, oh yeah, so yeah, there's so many people who are like, I don't understand, like, this is not possible, right? Like, there's no way you met this many people. And I'm like, well, you know, three to four people a day for six years. And like, I, you know, that, that was my job at Gumroad, right? It was like hiring people, talking to investors. Every Saturday, I would go to the coffee shop, I'd meet seven, eight people who reached out from Twitter uh, or email or Hacker News or something like that, you know? Because that's, and I just thought it was normal, right? And I still do that today. Like, I yeah. still like I go to a city or like, I, now I don't really broadcast it because I would just get sort of hammered. But, uh, but up until like two years ago I did, and now I would still sort of like DM people, right. That I have mutuals with or that I follow and be like, Hey, we should go hang out in this city, uh, or grab dinner, grab lunch, grab coffee, whatever, right. Post pandemic. And people just don't do that. I think there's just, there's not, there's a lot of people who it's, it's actually like an incredibly tiny amount of people that do that. It's, it's, right. And, the, and it's, it's not even like we're doing something right and they're doing something wrong. I think like, it's just like, they don't, they don't want to, they don't feel the need. Like I started raising this fund and I've been talking to, you know, hundreds of people about it at this point. And just some of the ways that I'm doing this, uh, like talking about it so openly doing the webinar about it, you know, like reaching out to as many LPs as I reach out. About. Like so many people have been like, how did you do this? Like, how did you, like in a month and a half, you went from nothing to like having a, a fund that's sort of, going to be significant in the ecosystem or whatever. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's not hard. Like, what I, like I like doing this. Like, I love yeah. talking to people about yeah. things that I care about. And so, like, you're, it's just, like, 150 one-hour one conversations. Like, I can do five to ten of those a day. I'm just walking around my suburb, you know, being on the phone with people. Uh, 
it's not hard. It's, it's like, it's not even, it, it's, it's, it's so not hard that I would do it with like, I just do it all day long anyways, you know, it's just like, yeah. Oh, I now have sort of like slightly sort of change my cone of vision to focus on this group of people instead of that group of people. But you know, I've been doing it forever. And I, I just think there's a, I, I, it's taken me up until now to really appreciate like how unique of a personality trait that is. Cause I'm an introvert. Like I don't think of myself as an extrovert at all, but I'm also like, I, you know, I'm like, like, I love Clubhouse. I love these sorts of things, but I'm much more the one-on-one -on -one type person where I'd like, I'll meet 10 people one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, while I'm in a city or something like that. And yeah, it's just, I think a lot of it is like figuring out your personality traits and like what, you know, like for example, that like Twitter works much better for me potentially uh, than Instagram or something like that. And figuring out like, what is the match, right? Like what is the sort of you creator kind of platform fit, I guess, right? Where you're like, you know, I do believe anyone can build an audience. Anyone can sort of earn a living doing what they love. It's like figuring out like, what, well, what do you like doing now, right? Like, what do you love doing? How do you love doing it? Do you want to do it solo with a team or like what are the sort of the dimensions and, and you know, sort of like make a big matrix, right? And figure out like the sort of where, where do you fall? And then be like, okay, if that's where I fall, you know, this is the kind of thing I should be doing. This is the kind of job that I should have. <laughs> Like, oh, I like talking to people for like four to five hours. Like, okay, you should probably like have like a newsletter where you do these, you know, long, deep, investigative sort of like reporting on certain people in their past, right? Like, like sure, I'm is doing uh, with, you know, it's just really, or you know, you might want to be a VC or you might want to be an artist or you might like, I just think people, people don't really figure, figure that out that it's actually like, I, I do totally agree it's like that efficient market hypothesis that like you're, the chance that you are currently con talking to and the people, the sort of hundred, let's say 150 people in your sort of like Dunbar numbers network are the right 150 people for you. is pretty low. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like you're not, there's 8 billion people almost out there, right? Like you're not talking to any of them actually. <laughs> Statistically you're talking to, to zero of the, yeah. of the 150 people you should be talking to. And that's fine. But you know, we should strive. I feel like to a degree to like find those people uh, and you know, because it just leads to, you know, leads to more innovation. It's just like more cool, yeah. cool stuff. I, I, I think one other thing I would add is like there, I do think people under, under or really unappreciate the, the upside that they don't see. Right. There's like sort of a famous HBS case study about sales where if you say, Hey, you know, if you sign up for this thing, you're going to get all of these things in, in value. You're going to get whatever, you know, a hundred dollars a month worth of value. That's, you know, and it costs 10 bucks, let's say for that, right? That's incredible. That's really hard to sell someone on because they're already living life without it, right? Like they don't, they're already in a static state. There's much more risk. Sort of, humans are very risk averse, right? So like, you're, you're, you're much more likely to buy Coke instead of some weird brand because like right. the 0 0 0 0 0 0.001% chance that thing might kill you, right? Uh, and people don't, I, if you reframe it and you say, you're currently at a negative baseline, you're actually losing $100 a month unless you pay for this thing. Effectively, it's the same, it's the same right. thing, right? right. It's just saying, it's saying, you know, it's kind of like hitting that button on the scale, resetting it to zero, right? It's like, right. and then getting on, it's just like, you could be here, but you're not instead it's you're down here right you, you're actually you're a sort of temporarily embarrassed millionaire right as they say right uh, and and that framing is incredibly effective because it right. sort of puts that person in a place where they're currently sort of efficient uh and then they might actually change and buy your product which is maybe not a good thing right like it might not be good to like feed people all yeah. these ideas that they're yeah that, they're, that they need shampoo but you know they need mcdonald's <laughs> they need xyz thing but that's sort of like a pretty known thing, I think, in marketing yeah. uh, as, a, as a sort of tactic that works. And I think people, mm -hmm. sort of on the creator side, I think people don't really think about that, right? Where they're, right. I think that's sort of like potentially sort of a good answer for that question of like, why don't people do more of this kind of serendipitous yeah. connection is because like it's, it's invisible to them. Uh, and, and you don't know, like, yeah, you just don't know what the upside is, right? Like you don't, like people are always thinking about black swans, right? But, and that's sort of like a very common sort of like, sort of plot device, I guess. But I, I think there's like a sort of whole interesting sort of like set of ideas around like white swans or whatever you want to call them, which mm. are like things that are going to totally change everything, like the iPhone, like the internet, 
and we don't really think about what those things might be. For example, right. like one really specific, and I'm not sort of advocating for any of this, I haven't done enough research, but like climate change is a really interesting one to me, right? Because there's this sort of like in that community of people who talk about it, we're fucked, right? <laughs> Effectively, yeah. like, or, or like, unless we do some crazy, crazy stuff, there are all these bad cases. But there is a possibility, in my opinion, there's some degree chance that we invent all of this amazing technology that makes it go away completely, right? And I'm not saying that like we, we have, we, that's possible, like, or, or like, I'm, I'm not saying that's gonna happen, right? And, and certainly it's not gonna happen unless we try really hard to make it happen. But there are a lot of things in our past that we didn't think were possible that ended right. up being right. possible, right? right. Uh, you know, like you, if you look outside your window or you look at your phone, like you, like even people 10, 15, 20 years ago would be sort yeah. of disbelief about what we're able to do. Like imagine this pandemic happening even 10 years ago, it would be, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I think like what if the pandem pandemic happened 10 years from now, we might, you might be like a hologram in my, in my living room. Right. right. We could be yeah. eating dinner. Together. I'm not saying that's, you know, I don't know. Right. Like yeah. that's the, right. And I, I, so I think there's, this, there's, there's that sort of idea that I'm really excited about spreading the gospel of too, which is like, we just don't know like the power of technology. Right. Like we don't know before the transistor was invented, mm -hmm. we kind of predicted all of the things right. that the transistor would have led to uh, or mm -hmm. flight or, yeah. you know, a lot of these sort of concepts and like DNA. And when we discovered that and right. germ theory, mm -hmm. like there are a lot of things we're doing right now that make zero right. sense. And like we'll look back on and be like what the heck like yeah. that's the way we, we made friends or like that's the way that we learned or that's the way that we fought wars like it just so many things i think don't make sense or like what like makes sense to us right but like in 20 30 years people are gonna be like what really like people ate this kind of thing or like people <laughs> commuted right. why would you commute like that makes no sense like like i think they're we just don't know what those are right, right. we don't i know have a I have a kind of complementary um, frame to that, which is, so my, my approach for a lot of things from, from based on like my personal inquiry and introspection, I, I came to, and, and my experience kind of building social networks with people is that um, a lot of problems, a lot of wicked, difficult problems are basically coordination problems, which means that, you know, it's like, it's like the, very, many people know the solution, but like because you can't coordinate everybody to kind of do it together at the same time, then it's not happening. It's the same as it's not working out. And the way to solve co one of the ways to solve coordination problems, it's almost it almost sounds stupidly simple, but it's really to just get all of the most important people connected with each other with e with each other so that they can they can act. And our imagination about, our social imagination, our cultural imagination about what groups of people can do is staggeringly limited by our very recent memory. And, you know, some people uh, are talking about, you know, I, I know that in the Valley, for example, there are people who are kind of revisiting the Apollo space program and, and the Manhattan project and, and trying to study those. And it's like, yeah, if, you know, I have this whole um, research project of my own which is like golden ages throughout history like the Baghdad house of wisdom you know when Indians invented zero the, there's, there's like hundreds of things like this and it's always it's always such a small group of people it's like so it's, it's some people think it's individual genius where if that was the case like we have to depend entirely on luck which is like then we're screwed kind of like it's, there's not much we can do about that but when you see that you know like the invent when when the atom was split there was like 12 guys who would meet regularly for coffee and they would they would bounce that idea around all of their heads and then it's like okay like if every great problem has been solved by a group of people like what are we doing to and i guess it's, to some degree the whole idea of having startups is kind of the to fund and solve like that that class of technological problem, but even more broadly than that, I think like like the like people seem to underestimate the capacity for cultural change by a small group of people getting together, like highly qualified or highly technical, diverse, whatever. You just get all those people in, and you, they don't even need to be like best friends or anything. They just need to know that each other exists. So there's like tons of very very smart 
very, very high potential people who don't do anything much because they don't know that each other exists and they don't connect with each other and they're kind of each stuck in their own small friend groups and arguing with their friends and they will tell their friends, hey, I want to, you know, like what if we worked on battery technology and their friends like, who the fuck are you? Like you shouldn't be working on battery technology and then yeah. they just don't get connected with the people that they should. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, I think in, in general, there is, I am incredibly like motivated with when I'm surrounded by people who are doing a lot of cool stuff, right? So starting a company and having employees next to me, I'm in a writing group that we meet once a week. Uh, you know, even just being as open and public on Twitter kind of like gives me like this accountability there, right? And, I re- and like even with painting and I realized like if I was left to my own devices, like by myself in the woods with all of the material that I could dream of, I would probably be incredibly unproductive. And right. so like, I, I'm productive because I, I like the social kind of interactions are what make yeah. me productive, right? Um, to, a, to a large degree, not completely, but it's a big, mm-hmm. it's a big part of like, what drives me. Right. Even I though think, I'm an introvert. Mm-hmm. Like I think, I think, you know, right. Attainment sort of thing. Right. In, from, my, from my reading, I think that the vast majority of people who have done great things, they are very much... Um, empowered and motivated by each other more than they are. So it's like, you know, there's, there's this, I, I think the, the general misunderstanding is that people who seek greatness want to be acknowledged for their greatness by the masses. I don't think that's as true as people tend to think it is. I think it's very much more often like a small group of people who understand each other very, very well and they want to kind of one-up each other and impress each other and, and kind of win each other's respect. And it's like, um, yeah, it's that. It's when you start to notice, when you start looking at the stories of discoveries and, and you know, even, even like uh, post-colonial, like nationalization in, like in Southeast Asia and stuff, like even, you know, India becoming a nation, like Gandhi, Nehru, like, oh, is this a bunch of, it's a very, very small group of people. It's crazy. It's crazy how much of the world has, has been nudged in some direction, good or bad, by very, very small groups of people trying to, kind of build off of each other's work. I think, yeah, like, you know, a writer who, like, if you look at even, um, you know, like those old Russian novels, like, who writes, you know, like, freaking tons and tons of text for, like, a general audience that you don't really know? Like, it doesn't really, it, in practice, and then somebody might read a novel and then think, I want to be a novelist, and then they start writing a novel in private on their own, and then they, they, they do it for, like, six months, and then they start to get burnt out because there's nobody to talk to about their novel. Whereas like the novelists, a lot of them, they, they go to a coffee shop and they meet the other novelists and then they're like, hey, what are you working on? And then you're like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to try something different. Like there's that totally. back and forth. And yeah, like once, once you see this, you'll be like, why is it, this is like of, you know, like from a nation state point, like from, I'm Singaporean and I think about it from like, from a nation state point of view, this is an issue of national security. It's like an issue of like national long-term and it's true like for humanity, right? <laughs> like in the face of climate crisis or whatever it is, like every... Anybody who's responsible for any group of people, and even you know, like a CEO of a company or whatever, like you would want to be thinking about how do I get these people to want to, not even like cha- make them change their mind about what they want, but just expose them to the fact that they could nudge each other to greatness, and like, you know, it's like a doing it on your own like okay like maybe one percent or 0.1 percent of some people are kind of like freaks who are like special freaks who manage to challenge themselves in a solitary state to try and be better but even then if you read like you know if you read uh napoleon's you know he you see in his diaries and stuff he's comparing himself to alexander and uh, he's in his imagination he's not alone right he's 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 kind of working in a dialogue with the greats throughout like centuries ahead and centuries after and that, that's even like a like what you were saying earlier about kind of the the project management of how do I make Mona Lisa happen? Like part of it is also like who are you doing? What what are you doing this for? Right? Like is it just to if it's just to gratify your own taste, you can probably be quite happy kind of just having fun at some local level. Which is again that, that you can have a very good life that way. You can be a good friend, good husband, good father, have a good life. Your funeral will be beautiful. Everyone will love you. It's a you, you can be proud of that life. Or if you happen to, you know, have a bit of, have, have more vision and you see the bigger picture and you're like, I could do that. Or I could do that and I could like contribute substantially to like the lighthouse of human consciousness. I'm like, oh my God, why? Once, once you see that, you can't, how do you unsee it? It's like you have to, you can, and I, so like with me and my motivations, 
I know I'm smart, like smart enough, right? Relative to my, my background circumstances. I know I'm living comfortably enough. Like I have a house, I have a wife. I, you know, I, I, I like my life. I could live a fairly innocuous life for the rest of my life and be reasonably happy. You know, like watch some nice movies, read some old books, play guitar. Like it would be a decent life. But then I, what, what works for me is that I remind myself of how when I was a teenager, I never met anybody like me or you. Like, like I never met anybody who was kind of like clued in to like the imagination and, and creative possibility. And I would have killed to have met someone like either of us. And I'm thinking there are definitely thousands, if not millions of kids like us who have not met people like us, who need to meet people like us so that they can breathe, right? Like they don't realize they're feeling stifled. And then I'm like, okay, so... Huh, you know, I'm nervous about starting a gum road and, and asking people for money for my book. So it's easier to not do that. And I can accept that for myself. I can accept that I'm a coward and I'm just going to play video games and not care. Like, that's fine. Like, like, if Visa is a loser, that's fine. But then, if that means that there's a kid who should hear from someone like me, but they don't, and it's because I was, you know, like all about my own feelings and my own kind of personal like I'm shy or I'm nervous that someone's going to judge me and therefore I'm not going to do that work. Therefore, the kid's not going to see me. It's like, okay, so it's like my inaction leads to that negative outcome or non-outcome. And I'm like, oh, I could do that. Or I could, you know, face my fear and just do it. And then I get to connect with the kids and make a difference to them. And then I find it much easier to motivate myself to act when I'm driven by trying to help those kids rather than trying to work on myself. Right. Yeah. I try to share that with more people. Because I find like sometimes when I tell people that they 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 it just it never occurs to them that they could think that way. It's just it's just yeah. reframing how you see it in your head. Totally. No, I think that makes a that makes a lot of sense. I'm trying to think about who I met in the early days that kind of like because that's sort of a lot of people ask me that, like what got me on this path. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of yeah, it's just, who knows I, like it's a random maybe i would have always ended up in this path or maybe i had a conversation i've since forgotten you know right that you know because like you're, you're not you don't you don't know which conversations are important right yeah. and uh which like even now i'm sort of in the mindset of raising this fund like i see all these relationships that have happened randomly you know 10 years ago that are now sort of like playing really important roles in my life right so you just don't know yes how these things are going to come together or certain ideas even like when I read certain books or when I write, like, I'm like, Oh, I'm pulling from this, you know, this thing that I saw because I like went left instead of right in the city six years ago and saw something, you know, and my brain recorded it down. And yeah, it's just super like, do you, have you ever seen that, uh, the artist Kim Jung Ji? Like he's, he does like the, he does like the ink pen stuff, like he, but he doesn't do any underdrawings, so he's drawing like. Oh right, right, right. It looks perfect from the inside out. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, he's great. He's you know he's a he's there are very few people who can do that. Right, like he's he's exceptional. It's actually I think bad because sometimes people look at them and they're like this is oh, this right. is what they think drawing should be. Yeah. They don't realize like no, there's all these things happening that you don't see that are like that it's sort of leveling on top of. The scaffolding is in his head. Exactly. It's, it's all, all of the, all of the underdrawing and the perspective and all that stuff is happening. It's just happening. He's able to visualize it on the paper, uh, which I can start doing now that I've been painting for so long, you know, uh, which I didn't even know was possible. Like I didn't know that's something that you could do over time is you can just see color, you know, it's like getting right. pitch perfect, right? Like you can just right. see things that, that other people don't see if you haven't sort of tuned your, tuned your brain, uh, but I, for, I forgot where I was going, but, but, but yeah, I, I think people underestimate like how, mm-hmm. you know, those sort of things will come together over, over time uh, and sort of how they might fit in. And so people just don't start building those things, right? They don't, they don't focus on building a network. Like when I talk to founders who are starting companies, like I think one of the big mistakes people can make is they don't do, they, they only start talking about things and meeting people and talking to customers when they're ready right. to start a company. Yeah. And so they're like, hey, I have an idea. I have this awesome thing. It's great. And I'm like, cool. Like, you know, where is it? Can I play with it? What have you learned since you started working on it? Can I talk to some customers? Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, I don't have any of that. I have a cool, you know, like a little app that you can check out or something. But I think it's like the people that I often want to work with. Are, you know, people who have this problem or 
interfacing with these people or building these different prototypes. I didn't start a company like I'm, I, you know, I'm still sort of on day one of that, but like I have all of this context on this problem space. Right. Uh, and I have all these potential customers that I already know. And when you, when you reach out to them, it's, it's like, I don't think people, it's really hard to go from zero to one. Right. Like if, if I like met you and the first thing I asked you was like, Hey, do you want to work together on this book? You'd be like, right. yo, slow down. <laughs> yeah. like, let's get yeah. to know it. You know, it's kind of yeah. that. Right. And it's the same thing with customers. It's the same yeah. thing with building an audience. I think so people, people that don't, who, who don't just start and sort of get into that over time. I think right. I mean, you can see it hurt certain authors, right? Like you see that with Patrick Rothfuss with Name of the Wind and Joe Jordan Martin and stuff. I think sometimes, right. sometimes like when you, you don't prime yourself and you don't grow into that scale and, and sort of how, that having that many eyeballs on you, you kind of run into this problem where you, you just, you haven't trained yourself in this, in these things and you have all these people staring at you and you're like forced to get on stage for the second right. time. Like you've never had the like 15 years of doing right. live, you know, like right. building those calluses uh and then and then you realize like when even if, if once you start you're like oh shit now it's going to take me 15 years to build these calluses i should have been i should have been working on building up this skill bank right so that you know for a variety of things that i could use them for and then when i have something i need them for i'm already five years into the process right like i was raising money for this fund 10 years ago i just didn't know it effectively right right right, right. yeah um, I was building all these relationships and meeting all these people and doing all these right. things that would set me up 10 years later to be able to raise a fund in a month. Right. But that's really sort of the overnight success problem, right? It's just like right. you see yeah. the, the beginning is assumed to be at a very like a legalistic point of view. Like, right. oh, you started this company or this uh, thing, no, yeah, or this yeah. day, right? Uh, you started this YouTube channel on this date, uh, but it's like totally arbitrary, right? Like that yeah. doesn't mean anything. Uh, one, of my, one of my riffs with my friend Sonia is that we are always recruiting for some expedition that we don't know what it is yet. Like we haven't yet, like we're always looking, you're always keeping an eye out for the crew, right? And then you, you have good interactions yeah. with them or whatever. And you're like, you know, you're not, you're not like, can I count on your vote or whatever? But like, you just, you know what I'm about. I know what you're about. And then, you know, like, so I ended up working for a guy that, like I was doing some consulting work for Andres. He's, he's based in Estonia. And like, we both just knew each other from the comment sections of uh, growthhackers.com. Like we were just both, we both noticed that, Hey, the other guy puts a lot of effort into his content when everyone else is kind of just throw away comments. And so like, it was like a year later, two years later when he was like, Hey, I'm starting a company. Do you want to work with me or something? And I'm like, I actually don't want to work with anybody right now, but like, I will make an exception for you because I, I like your comments so much that I'm willing to kind of, play along and it was a good time and we made decent money and similarly um i know that so tiago forte he he was so i had never before paid for an online course on anything like i'm just i'm, I'm kind of i still have a bit of the broke teenager mindset of i'm not gonna pay for anything <laughs> i'm just gonna read the free stuff and whatnot but like uh, i remember he did a blog post analyzing every single to-do list app that's available and like just the amount of intensity that he brought to every like he was just, you can tell that the guy who's like evaluating this, he really has had, like he really wants to know what's up. And you can tell, right? you can tell if, if you've been reading content for a while, you can tell when someone's writing just to fill out the word count. And when someone's writing because they're freaking frustrated with the problem that they want to understand. And they're like, I don't understand this. Like, could, is it this or is it that? And whenever I see someone who has, you can smell the frustration with the problem. Then it's like I, I, my willingness to trust that person about something in that space goes up a lot. Like it's just you want, yeah, you really want people who are like you know. And very often people, it's the same when people talk about like Steve Jobs and they talk about insanely great. Like they tend to forget how that manifests like in his personal life. Like if you read about like uh, you know, he would have conversations with his family for weeks about whether or not what kind of washing machine they're buying. Like that's the kind of, that's his personality that led to his products. And I think some people then think, oh, I should try to be like that with my stuff, which is not, which is not the correct lesson. The correct lesson I think is to find out, pay attention to the personality that you already have and then see how that, like what you were saying about, you know, whether you should talk to a lot of people or not. Like, so for me, it's like, I'm naturally very prolific. And so any job that I would do that, let's say requires me to not be, like I'm going to do a horribly edit. And any, any, any space I can work on where I can do 10,000, 100,000 tweets or make 10,000 videos, like I'm going to benefit because I have that inclination. It's just, yeah, it's just, uh, 
my turn to go out. <laughs> yeah, you get it. It's it's, yeah. it's 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 funny how difficult it can be to to convey these things to people who kind of are not receptive to hearing it. But when you encounter someone who gets it, it's like you know. Uh, and yeah. you know, you you're mentioning perfect pitch, and I've I've, I've been I've been. I've been playing music casually for for like a decade plus. Like for me, when I was a teenager, I was just I want to play music because you know it's it's it looks cool. I want to be a rock star, meet, make friends, that kind of thing. And um, I'm like decent ish. I would never describe myself as oh I'm a musician. How are you? You know I'm like my music playing ability is is embarrassing for someone who has been adjacent to this music scene for so many years. But recently, I just like you know I like playing the guitar and I'm decent at it. And like, what's stopping me from getting better? I can, if at any point in time I decide to get better, then I just assemble a little project of what I'm gonna learn and what I'm gonna focus on and blah blah blah, and I can get better. So, I thought let let me do it. I haven't done it in a few years. Let's let's see if there's any you know any gains I've gotten on my personal end that's nothing to do with music that's gonna benefit my music. And it turns out it's true. So I, I you know one of the things I did was I looked up the musicians that I most admire to see what they said about it. And two of them, are, one is Victor Wooten, he's a bass player, and one is Guthrie Govan, he's a guitarist. And both of them are incredibly technically skilled and gifted. And they both have the exact same kind of uh, pedagogy, right? Which is that they both said music is a language. And just think about how you learn English or whatever is your first language. Like you don't, you don't go to grammar school and study prepositions and verbs and whatnot. Like you just practice talking with other people. I mean, you're a child, you know, yeah, you speak yeah. in sim- you, you speak in simpler language, and you know your parents will help you by speaking simpler to you and speaking more slowly so that you can kind of fit in. And you try to imitate and you experiment, and over time you get better and better at it. And they're like, it's the same thing with music. So like the first thing you should do is kind of learn to hear better and learn to play along with other people's music and learn to learn to so the thing that i'm doing right now is practice singing melodies that you know you know so you know like disney songs or happy birthday or whatever and then like if you can hear it in your head you should be able to play it on your instrument and like it sounds completely simple and obvious but when i try to do it i realize there's a bit of friction between like i have to like i, I make some mistakes i'm like oh no that's not right oh like, i'm feeling my way around it and as I get better at it, I can feel my musical intuition getting better. And I've also been doing a little bit of sketching on the side. And it's like, yeah, it's like when the perspective starts to click for you and you realize that, oh, you shouldn't go that far. You should stop here. You should like this. And it feels like that knowledge is beyond conscious mind. It's like, it's, you're not thinking what you're doing. And so that, like you were asking earlier about something like, you're saying something about how people underestimate how much they can learn. And like, I think it's because they are estimating what they can consciously remember. But like all the benefits are the things that get programmed into your subconscious, like how much you should eat or what you should lift or whatever. It's like, you're not even thinking about it. The form gets internalized and then you don't need to think about it. Yeah. yeah so it's I mean, language, the operation- language is a really good one. Language is a really, really good sort of example uh, because you, no one is taught how to speak a language. Right. right. No one, no one has taught that. You see a baby or a child, or or even later on in life, even though your neuroplasticity kind of goes down, you're like you can't explain. Like when we're speaking to each other in English, like we're using, we're using concepts and things that we don't actually understand. Yeah. Right. And and when someone messes them up, so like a really popular one is like the like the the red big car. Right. Like you right. would never say the red big car. Yeah. You would say the big red car everyone who speaks English fluently kind of understands that, knows that. And it's sort of like so jarringly obvious like that that's wrong. And that is basically what happens when you do that kind of perspective line and you know yeah. it's off. But, right. you know, even like the day before, you wouldn't have noticed that. You Like right. your brain right. wouldn't have picked up on like there's something wrong here. Mm-hmm. And it's impossible to teach someone that. Someone has yeah. to get, and I think that yeah. goes to your point of the group thing, right? It's just like, because really people are able to to like learn by mimicking and learn by being like copy pasting. And when you have groups of people that you can look at doing that all the time, you get start to get much, much better, much, much faster. Uh, but a lot of people, I think they focus on the, on the teaching part. Like okay. if you wanted to learn a language, you would spend like all this time, like reading a dictionary, like that would be the worst way to learn a language. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But that's kind of how we think about a lot of these other things. Like the best thing to do if you're trying to learn how to code, or anything is to watch people do it really i think yeah. right like to uh that's how i learned ios developments i watched a stanford professor teach you know learn like 
Ivan Dahl, like he has a, he was a Stanford professor. He worked at Apple before that. And he has a, you know, on iTunes University, Stanford has a free course on iPhone development, iOS development now, you know, and it's just, it's just, it's just showing you, you know, it's just showing you like, this is how you, this is someone making an iPhone app in front of you and you just copy the steps and you also now have an iPhone app. Right. right. And it's just, you need to, you need to kind of just go through the exact same motions that they're going through. And that's how you build the muscle memory. Um, but you're right. It's, it's, it is, it is sort of beyond your conscious ability. I can't tell you why I'm doing a certain thing. Uh, I can kind of try to explain it to you after if you point it out, but the truth is just like red, big car. Like it just, yeah. we know it's wrong. It right. feels wrong. And you know, it's, it's also, yeah, it's like when someone, you can't even, exp- yeah, you can't explain it when someone says like, you know, me no want X or whatever. And you're like, I don't want, you're supposed to say, but like, why, why I am not me? Yeah. Why no instead of don't, right? right. You already, right. you know what I was saying. You got right. the point, which is why you're able to help me improve yeah. on it, but it's wrong, right? It just feels off. Uh, and that's, I think that's the exact same. That's why I think I, when I refer to painting and writing and things, I like refer to them as communication skills, mm. right? because really you're trying to take an idea and translate it effectively uh, and typically compress it. Uh, yeah. right like and that's like and that's just like learning a language right like and it, it and it's not impressive that's the i think the other point about it is no one is impressed by someone speaking english right anymore uh no one is impressed by someone speaking chinese no one is really impressed by people who can speak english chinese japanese korean spanish etc at the same you know like if they learned it at an early enough age it's like oh yeah that's fine but that is so much harder to me in my opinion than almost anything else like right. speaking right. a language is so crazy complicated to me like compared to learning how to paint you know right. learning perspective like they're just it's it seems to me that like painting is much easier sort of perspective like all you know that's why you can get computers to do a lot of 3d stuff but you don't have computers that might you know at least not yet gpt3 might change everything but <laughs> You know, like it's still early days in terms of like getting getting computers to communicate like humans communicate. Right. Uh, so that's kind of like when I get into other things, I oh I kind of go back to that David Deutsch concept of like I can learn this. Yeah. It's like functionally possible for my brain to have right. the thing that it needs to solve this problem, to paint, right. to write, to make videos, mm-hmm. you know, to write a book, to do a VC right. firm if I want to. Like they're 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 all just like variations of the same thing. And I just have to kind of, I don't know what those things are because I don't know those things yet, you know, right, uh, right. but I can, I can, I know I can learn those things. I know I can read a book or I can sort right. of see someone do it and I can do it myself and I can be like, Oh, I'm getting better. And I know, right. you know, I, I, what I can do is, is, is just like pointing out the mistakes, right? Like I can, I can see a lot of the mistakes now, Yeah. you know, I can see it. Oh, I would have done this investment decision yesterday, but I, since then I've learned this and I would no longer do it. And you start to add to that uh, over time. And you have basically, you have like thousands and thousands and thousands of those things. And that's why I think part of why you can't communicate it to somebody else, right? It's it's, it's like, oh, to, I did this instead of that. I can tell you why it's just going to have to, I'm going to have to go back to like 10 years worth of different little insights. It's like a massive flow chart, right? Right. Like it's like an insanely massive flow chart while you're making a certain decision. Uh, Yeah. So it, it would be inefficient to teach someone that, right? Like it would, it would, it would be like, you know, like you, you wouldn't, if, if it requires you to go through the flow chart every single time you have to make a decision, you would like, you need, you need to figure out how to get it so ingrained in you that you're able to make those decisions. Cause when you're writing, you're painting, you're doing these things, you're making these decisions a lot. Right. Right. So right. like the guy doing the ink things, right. Like if he was actually taking the time to do all the drawings of all the perspective and stuff, it would take him like 50 hours instead of five minutes. If right. That makes sense. Right, right, right. Yeah, each each person kind of has to figure it out from their own frame of reference. But it's a yeah, they're kind of first principles, right? Like you have to yeah. you have to start with like math, and then yeah. go to physics, and like that's right. how you you know you have to you can't build on. And that's the problem to me that I have with the news and politics and stuff. Is oh like, yeah, for sure. You know, you're basically learning the top level. Right. You're like, well, this, this is you know this is bad. Or this is good. This is why. But you're not really like going back through history and like really building from 
scratch like a, in a, a model of why this world is right. the way it is and so right. like you're arguing about something but you don't understand any of the reason that that thing is yeah. the way it, and i don't either i'm not saying i do right i'm right. just saying that no one does it's too complex at this mm -hmm. point like the system is so big right. that everyone should just focus on like a single part of it and get real yeah. like those problems and like hope that there are enough other people out there doing the same thing for other problems and like we should enable people to do those things and trust that they, like, most people have good intentions and we should kind of build a system that protects people from people that don't have good intentions obviously but but like in general like allowing those folks to kind of you know discover the number zero and like talk about these things openly and et cetera, et cetera. like i think that's that's sort of necessary for like a lot of this kind of innovation to, to happen like for that kind of beginning of infinity yeah. kind of concept to, you know you need to create like an, an environment where or you don't like the other sort of point of view is that it's going to happen anyways like there are enough going to be enough of these sort of groups of people forming through you know using different technology or something that you can't suppress it and it actually doesn't matter how much you try it like it's sort of like this simulation argument right like it's inevitable that we reach the singularity and like you know we, we sort of right. invent general purpose ai and stuff like we're just because that's what our, you know that's sort of like where we are in our just evolutionary pipeline and we just will eventually get to these you know we might like destroy the earth you know like almost you know a few times over but like eventually yeah. one you know we'll get through the the sort of the chasm we'll cross that chasm uh yeah yeah i don't know yeah i mean ultimately i find that after you after you kind of like in conversations with people like if you get to very strange scales like whether you're talking about like like time scales or whatever it's like or you know even even when you're talking about like i think in the context of politics in bigger countries so like in india and china and the us it's like again talking about politics in a large country it's 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 disempowering in a sense i mean it's it's kind of disconnected from your personal human level um uh, intuitions i think and so usually i very often I try to bring things back to ultimately like, okay, like we can discuss anything at length indefinitely, but like the, 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 then what, right? Like, so what, what are you going to do about it? Like if it, I, I've actually come to believe, I mean, when I was like a teenager, I guess I had like no responsibilities and I was obsessed with kind of trying to develop my intellectual capacity for questioning and, and, uh, considering as many things as possible or whatever but these days i think i'm more like uh I've, I've done my my fair share of that probably more than the average person ever will and now it's more of like how can i how can i help my friends how can i help people that i care about and like what how can we make things materially like so i guess it's like it's slightly incrementalist although if somebody told me that they had a bold plan to make something dramatically better i would be like okay how can i help you right like that kind of Kind of thing. It's unlikely that I'm going to abandon everything I'm doing to join you on your bold plan unless you can sell me on it. I think the thing that I've been thinking about is how like, and this goes back to what you're talking about, about like marketing, um, like what is known about loss aversion and stuff. I think like true persuasion is, and this is a very recent I, framing I've done that I, I haven't thought about much, but like I think real, real persuasion is almost beyond conscious choice, both on the part of the person speaking and the person receiving. It's like there's some... There's, there's some, again, it, I, maybe it's similar to the big red car kind of thing where if you're trying to persuade someone but you don't have that, that uh, it's hard to not get a bit wooey about this, but I, I think it's just, it's a matter of like conscious and unconscious knowledge and what you know and what you don't know. So if you don't have the unconscious knowledge or the subconscious knowledge about what you're talking about, someone else who is a thinking, who is, you know, kind of clued in and uh, as long as they're not like a clueless person who's just going to go along with whatever someone else is saying like if they are a moderately skeptical person like whether or not they are persuaded is dependent on whether or not like they detect that you are telling the truth about the thing if, if you get what i'm saying so it's just i i mean i and i and i approach that kind of after having some after agonizing for a while about the nature of persuasion and and trying to persuade people of things and trying to be charming and trying to be authentic and all those things. And I've come, like, it's, it's very funny. It's one of those things where like, it's like you go on a big journey and then you find out at the end that the, the thing that you're looking for was with you all along, that kind of thing. It's like, I, I, I'm a marketing guy. I'm interested in philosophy. I'm asking a lot of questions. But at the end of the day, like when you finally exhausted all of your 
options and considerations. It's like whether or not people believe me on, about something, it boils down to like a very, it's almost out of my hands. It's almost like a, like, you know, there's, there's all the stuff you can do. And then the final leap is, is a kind of, a kind of chaos, a kind of madness. And uh, I find that there's a certain, there's a certain um, Zen kind of, um, a calm to it, like a kind of acceptance. Like you do, you do everything that you can do. And then there's a point where you hit ship or whatever. And then it's like, what happens beyond that is no longer up to you. And like being aware of that for me, is, is just something that I've been thinking about recently because I, I, I guess I agonize over like bad outcomes. And I'm like, could I have avoided that? Like to some degree, yes. But also sometimes to some degree, no. Like if there's like a statistical probabilistic, like you talk to a thousand people, one person's going to rub you the wrong way or whatever. Like, you shouldn't overcorrect and try to make sure that that never happens. Like some unhappy customers is like necessary almost. Like this kind of coming yeah. into that. Totally. So, how how have you felt about as you know? So um you know in in with regards to making Gumroad, I think is something that strikes me as you being someone who's kind of further along a certain kind of path than me. So I, I haven't started my own. I mean, okay, I have like a t-shirt company with like another guy, but it's not, you know, you, you're facing like, well, how many, like a thousands of, how many users do you guys have? Like the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Yeah, tens of thousands. Right? Great. So that's, yeah. so what's, what's, what's that been like for you? Like facing tens of thousands of creators? Like what's the psychological, it's a kind of extreme sport, right? Like just an interfacing with so many people. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, honestly, sometimes I forget. Like, I try not to even think about that too often. Uh, you know, we see the numbers and stuff, right? You can see the dashboards, but it's, yeah, I think the best thing to do, honestly, is to, it's, it's like if you were playing a basketball game, right? Like, the whole point is to make it feel like you're playing with your friends, right? If you realize, like, you're on TV and this and that, right. and, like, there's the noise and the fans and all that kind of stuff, right? Like, you know, there's the whole stat around away games and home games and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so I think it's a lot of it is like trying making, like figuring out how you make it so that you don't think about all of these other things. I mean, it's good to, you know, to understand the impact that you have too, right? You don't want to do anything stupid with it. But I do think it's like in terms of building a product, at least, like it's like you kind of want to just turn off a lot of that kind of stuff and really focus on, you know, the few sort of the few conversations that don't scale every week that, you know, are similar to the ones I was doing 10 years ago. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's really identical really. And everyone is in that. The interesting thing is, is I'm, I'm, I'm sort of talking to, it's a different set of people all the time, but everyone's in that sort of in a specific part of their career, right? Like I'm not talking to Taylor Swift. I'm not talking to like total yeah. noobs. I'm like kind of talking to this people who are going from zero to one and in that kind of place. And I've been doing that for so long, right? So like that doesn't change things too much. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think the, the nicest thing about it is it feels, I feel like no matter what, every single day I have, it's productive, right? Because right. like as long as, as, like at a minimum, I have helped creators make four to $500,000 today, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so like I, I think it gives me a lot of freedom to kind of go pursue other things and explore and I think a lot of that does end up coming back to help Gumroad and I, you know, builds my audience, builds Gumroad's audience, builds affinity for the company. Uh, you know, kind of go, going to that kind of like the white swan. Like, I don't, you know, there's some positive stuff out there for the company. I just don't know what it is yet. Uh, and I, I think fo like it allows me to focus on that, like at a level that most people like they, you know, they might wake up and they, they feel like they're starting at zero unless they do something like unless they go out and make something happen. And I, I really like that. Like it, it makes me feel very comfortable. Like, like I know if I just wake up, I like go on Slack, I go on email, I make sure everything is good to go. I like my, you know, doing, it's easy. It's like easy to have a large amount of impact for me at this point. And so nice. I think it allows me to think about, well, how do I get, you know, how do I sort of experiment on this other stuff to increase my impact by like 10 X or hundred X, right? Like how, what's the next leverage point for me? And like the next leverage point is only interesting if it is like a big multiple of what I can currently do, if that right. makes sense. Uh, so like starting this fund or like tweeting or, you know, writing a book or whatever, like those are ways to kind of sort of figure out what's the next kind of level. Cause I actually think growth is kind of like a step function. Right. It looks like this when you zoom out, right. This kind of curvilinear thing, but it's actually like, it's just these jumps 
it's like, if you really break it down, it's one by one, right? Every single person who follows you is a one little increase. It just zoomed out. It looks like this curve. And so it's like figuring out, I think it's like never forgetting that, I guess that to, to, like your relationship with Gumroad is like one relationship with Gumroad. And like, right. we're never like, it's like you, the Gumroad is just a, a collective of those experiences happening. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so I'm really focusing on like, what does that experience look like? Feel like, what does it allow people to do? Not getting so consumed about like, how do we help like a hundred thousand creators do this? It's like, let's just focus on the single experience for the single creator, make yeah. it really, really great. And then the other, this sort of the score will take care of itself, right? Like that yeah. kind of stuff will figure itself out. It will, you know, we'll either do a great job. We won't do a great job. We'll be a massive company. We won't be a massive company. That's all random right to a degree like i can focus on what you know what we know how to do really well it's like writing a book right you could write a phenomenal book that does nothing or does okay or you could write like an open book that does phenomenally well because of some weird confluence of events and you just can't predict that so i think it's almost like let's not focus on like vcs and all these people pinging all the time it's like what do you want to do what do you like and i'm like i just want to make gumward better like I just, you know, we're launching memberships. So that's going to be awesome. We're going to start competing in that space, which is going to be interesting. But it's about building the best product that we can do for that use right. case. It's not about winning the market or like about getting to a certain size. It's about like, can we really be the best product for that use case? And I think we can, we'll see, but I think we have a shot. And that's kind of how I think about it, which is, you know, the same as if we're 10 times bigger than we were today, right? Like, if we were processing four to five million dollars a day for creators, hopefully my life would be pretty similar to what it, you know, I would be able to do this Zoom call with you and we'd just chat, you know, at like nine, 10 in the morning, my time, right? Even right. though all well, this volume happening, right? That you can't see flowing yeah. through the air, you know, every second, so. That's interesting. That's, that's nice to hear as a, as a user. Like, uh, I always think that it's so um, unfortunate that it see i mean like so there's this general understanding about kind of the the life cycle of of products in just all kinds of of products including you know like uh just ebay was once great and then it became not great paypal was once great and then it became not great just the sense of the it seems almost inevitable that every good every there's like a golden age for some product where all the right people at the company and they are excited to work there and the technology is right and, and everything's going well and then there's like a general understanding of, oh, you know, eventually it, it, it's past its prime. The good people leave maybe, or like there's some new technology that they should be adopting, but they're not. And like, I don't know the specifics of it, but like, um, I don't know. It's just, I, I, I feel like, uh, I mean, I've done a bunch of reading about this stuff. I've talked to a bunch of people about this stuff, but I still don't have like a, I, I, I don't have like a coherent kind of um unified theory of great products. It's just that I, I know a good product when it's a good product. And I, you can kind of tell when it's not anymore. So like Quora used to be a good product and then along the way, I mean, a good community space, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually it kind of stopped being that. And like you can try and construct some explanations, but there's a certain, uh, I don't know, maybe it's pressures from, from VCs. Maybe it's uh, scaling issues, but... I think honestly, I think, I think we just have a desire to grow. I, I think VCs are a part of that for sure. But there's just something innate. I mean, I see it because I fight it, you know? Right. I get the kind of like, I get those feelings of like, oh, we can be 10 times bigger. We can be better and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I read books on stoicism and I, you know, I'm familiar with like the, the sort of costs of going down that route and nothing matters right. and whatever, right? Uh, we should just be meditating and listening to our own thoughts all the time. But it, inevitably, like, that stuff does drive me to a degree and that's okay. It just, yeah, what it is like, it's a, you know, I'm like a monkey and there's like a, you know, there's a bunch of sugar over there that I want. Right. Like there's just some inherent things that are sort of forcing my hand and my behavior. And like, I don't think that's necessarily bad. I just think being aware of that happening, like, Oh, it's interesting yeah. that this, you know, this thing is driving me in this way. Right. Like it doesn't right. have to be bad. It just is, you know? Right. It's, it's, yeah, it's more of like, uh, I guess, being mindful of the consequences and not being like, you know, so again, like eating junk, like I, I, I don't relate to anybody who's kind of like, 
I will never touch any junk food whatsoever because you know it's just bad. I'm like you know, like you can have a pizza. You know, it's just it's just like be be careful that you don't spiral into becoming kind of a sugar addict and you're not even enjoying it anymore. But you just feel like that's what you need more and more of. And like you know, like if you if you do this and you have you know you have to balance it off with something else and then you do that and then you kind of can keep playing. I guess it's a it's a bit of a finite infinite game thing where like if you enjoy the game, you want to continue enjoying the game. And so you might like try something different or, you know, push yourself in a certain way, but like you just have to recenter that you're still enjoying the game, I guess. Like, so I, I approach that, I guess, with, uh, my, my, I face that a little bit in terms of, let's say, growing my Twitter following, for example. Like as a marketing guy, I know what I would have to do to kind of grow fast, but uh, I, I kind of deliberately choose not to. I mean, I think if I had a company that I was trying to get more, like eyeballs on, I would be more assertive in doing something close to what you're doing. But like for me right now, since I'm not doing that, I'm kind of trying to optimize for keeping my mentions interesting. But like, yeah, and I, I guess optimizing for interestingness is like, uh, is, a, is itself an interesting, it's like, a, it's like an open problem in a way because you can make a, a space, like a community space, so I understand communities pretty well, I guess, but like you can, you can make a community space um, very safe and very kind of pleasant but it stops being interesting if it's not growing like if it's not growing then eventually everybody says everything they have to say everybody recognizes each other's faces nobody's doing anything i know very often people have this kind of fantasy of let's all my group of friends let's all go and start a commune somewhere i've never related to that i've always been like we'll get sick of each other in a few months you know it's like you know the same when you have friends that you like but then you see each other once a week or something and then if you're going to see each other every day for a few months like you're you're going to go a bit crazy you need that. You need some amount of randomness, some amount of novelty for new for interestingness. And I guess different people have different personality traits for how much novelty they need for interestingness. And there's also interestingness that comes from nuance. So if you're bored, you can always get more interested in something by looking at it closer and seeing it in greater detail. Uh, you get it. You know, it's just I'm just thinking out loud at this point. But yeah, I gotta, I gotta run. I have uh, another call. Oh yeah. Again. <laughs> Absolutely, dude. I, I was expecting this to be like 45 minutes, but we just kept chatting. Uh, <laughs> this has been so fun, dude. I'm gonna yeah. it, let, let me end the recording and.